and welcome to Lion's Den. I am Maureen Lyons, and today we're, I'm talking to two storytellers, Margaret Cardoza, who is a self-advocacy -advo coordinator for Community Partners in Biddeford, and Mike Harris, who is a humorist and storyteller. And they are members of a group called Moose, the main organization of storytelling enthusiasts. So tell me what Moose is. Moose, it's an organization of people who are trying to continue the <coughs> oral tradition of storytelling. It's not necessarily just for children. We meet once a month at the Rhines Auditorium in Portland Public Library. And we, our first event starts at 6.30. It's Meet the Moose, so the people who are part of our herd uh, welcome new people to come who want to. Is it open mic for at well, the beginning? Well, that's what we do at 7 o'clock. First thing is a little social gathering, food, coffee, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then an open mic for about 45 minutes where people can step up and tell a story for about 10 minutes, no more than that. Mm -hmm. And then we have a featured storyteller who comes in <coughs> and does 45 minutes or so. So it's a, it's a great evening. You never know what you're going to I get. I know. I was there that, that last month, I guess, and you had a, a woman who was just incredible, mm -hmm. Joe Radner. Yes. So um, maybe you can ask Margaret. OK. Margaret what? is a member of Moose as well, and as you said, She's the self-advocacy coordinator at Community Partners. And what that is, the self-advocacy movement, <laughs> is people with um, disabilities learning to take a stand. Margaret tells her stories, uh, and she helps coach her peers so that they can tell their stories as well. Um, Margaret, how is storytelling part of this? self-advocacy -ad group that you work with? Well, the purpose of storytelling in self-advocacy is about three aspects that help a person, such as healing from wounds, telling history, and informing the public. The first being when we speak up about our stories, they're memories of a lot of pain and shame. When a person starts telling their story, they start to find ways to get comfortable with themselves and recover from their pain, healing their wounds, and finding they're not alone. They discover they're connected with others who also relate to their stories. Secondly, in the past, people with disabilities were hidden from society. When we tell our stories, we help people learn what it was like to be mislabeled, mistreated, and why it's important not to do that anymore. In example, there's a new generation at this time that are growing up not learning about AIDS and how people were treated when AIDS first came out. Because of people telling their stories, an example about AIDS, that help people remember why we don't want to treat people the way it was then. Matter of fact, in the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, they wrote into the law about the anti-discrimination issues that occurred to people with AIDS so that that will not happen again. And then finally, self-advocacy and telling our stories is about a civil rights movement. We try to help politicians and the public learn what had happened in the past so that we can live a life like anyone else for the pursuit of happiness. Oh, great. Mm. And Margaret wants to share part of her story now. This is entitled, Beyond Tenacity, A Self-Advocate's Journey. Margaret Cardoza. 
Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Maureen. I'm going to share with you some of my experiences of being labeled with a disability and how I struggled with my experiences, how the laws changed, and how I found hope in myself and with others. When my mother was carrying me, the doctors had prescribed barbiturates and tranquilizers with her. During those days, nobody knew if there was going to be any side effects or any problems. There were problems. Prenatally and at my birth, the doctors had requested to euthanize me. I had much complications at birth, but my parents were my first advocates, mm. and they told them to do their best to keep me alive. When I started to go to kindergarten, I was labeled that R word, that nasty word, retarded. It was horrible. They considered me uneducable. So I was kicked out of the school, <coughs> and I was placed on a special bus, and I was sent to a special school away from everyone. Well, the laws changed in 1970, and with the laws changing, I was able to go back to the school I was kicked out of. <laughs> I'm back! <laughs> I was uh, receiving speech and language services in what, a closet. What, were the pro what was the problem when you were born? What were the problems? I'm going to get to that because the issue is how people get labeled differently. Well, at the time, they recognized I had a speech problem and thereby started providing me speech and language services. But I was put in a closet to do that. Nobody wanted to hear me was the message when I was in that closet. I struggled with the educational system very much all my life. I was able to attain a master's degree in education. I received support from vocational rehabilitation services. I was reevaluated with another label, aphasia, a language disorder, based on anoxia the lack of oxygen to my brain. There is a part of my brain that was damaged. I received a lot of great support and they provided funds to assist me in my work with community partners. I have been working as a self-advocacy coordinator with community partners. I am thankful my parents' advocacy for me to keep me alive. I'm grateful that they don't give barbiturates or tranquilizers to pregnant women anymore. Prenatal care is wonderful right now, and we're getting better and better. And I'm glad the laws changed, Absolutely. that I was able to support myself and help others as you can see, people with disabilities have to have a lot of courage to get past a lot of people telling them no. I was able to find my own voice and live a journey of a valued life. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Margaret. Thank you. And can I ask, how have you healed through the storytelling? Well, this is a wonderful question. Thank you, Mike. The challenge is starting to speak up when everyone told you don't speak up. To get that courage and the tenacity to go beyond that fear, I was able to discover that I'm okay. Uh -huh. I, feel, I feel pretty good. 
there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with anyone else. And with that made me recognize how important it is to being accepting of myself, to feel comfortable. And knowing with this skill, as a role model, I work with others that they learn to tell their stories. I see the same progression of how painful it is to talk about their stories. When they discover it doesn't hurt to talk about it, they start to recognize it feels better and better, and all of a sudden they realize we have a message to give others. It's okay to talk about it. That's how it's been healing. It's been wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you. Now, do you have a story? I do. <laughs> I just happened to have brought one with me. Okay, if you, good. If you uh, want to hear it. I do. Um, I don't think the message will be quite as deep as Powerful. Margaret's. But as I said before, you never know what you're going to get with, with stories. And I tend to focus on relationships and communication. I tell true stories. And, and this one that I'd like to share with you is called Daddy's Little Girl. It was the 13th day of the second month of 1984 when Daddy's little girl came into this world. The nurse came in, scooped her up, cleaned her off, and put her in an incubator, a square glass case to keep her warm. I walked over, I looked down, and I smiled. I swear, she looked me right in the eyes and sneezed. Gesundheit, <laughs> uh. I said. Oh no! The very first word I said to my daughter was German. She must have thought she was born in Europe. It took me 20 minutes to convince her that no, this was the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <laughs> every year on her birthday, I tell that story. And every year, she laughs. It's amazing how fast 18 years go by. And all the twists and turns as we raised her from infancy in Massachusetts to the high school years in Maine. But I guess those twists and turns were never more evident than on her high school graduation day. And let me tell you about that. It started out like any high school graduation day, I suppose. She awoke at 4 a.m. Uh, to call her friends and speak for hours and hours about what they were going to do with their hair under the cap and what they were going to wear underneath the robes. And, and the plan was that my family was going to be coming up from Massachusetts, arriving, oh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. That was the plan. About 10 o'clock, the phone rang. It was my mother and my sister, Nana and Auntie Jo calling from somewhere in South Central New Hampshire. Evidently, coming out of Boston, they, instead of taking Route 95, they had taken Route 93 and completely missed the state of Maine. <laughs> now, they're calling me for directions, and I don't know why, because they can't follow directions. <laughs> but I did my best to get them back on track, and I remember hanging up the phone and saying, you know, this isn't going as well as it could have. About 11 o'clock, Daddy's little dirt girl comes running down the stairs with the final graduation outfit. A white top that was way too tight, a powder blue skirt that was way too short, and cruddy old sandals that were just totally inappropriate for the occasion. I bit my lip, I smiled and told her how nice she looked. And she said, all the seniors have to go to the Merrill Auditorium by 11.30, and I don't have time to wait for Nan and Annie Joe." And out the door she went. Oh. A little while later, the phone rang again. <laughs> Nana and Auntie Joe. Remember the trouble with directions? Evidently, take a left off the exit ramp was too difficult, because instead of taking a left and coming out to Gorham and eating the $87 worth of food I had prepared, 
they had taken a right and found themselves lost in Portland. And there really wasn't enough time for them to come out to Gorham, eat the $87 worth of food I had prepared, and then make it back into Portland for the ceremony. So I said, okay, where are you? And my sister says, well, there's a McDonald's across the street, and boy, are we hungry. <laughs> my son and I hopped in the car and off to make a, uh, a rescue over at St. John Street. And as we arrived, we opened the door, and inside the restaurant was total chaos. A young boy had fallen and he had hit his head and there was blood and he was crying and an older woman was trying to calm him down. Her white pantsuit just covered with blood and then a younger woman was trying to calm down an infant little girl, the sister who was wailing and the young father was walking around with that look only young, young fathers can get, just glazed over. I don't think I need to tell you, this is my family at their finest hour. <laughs> now, we had to make a decision. Do we go to the emergency room or do we go to the graduation? We, we didn't have time for both. <laughs> now, fortunately, both my sister and her husband are medical professionals and they determined that the boy's injury really wasn't that bad that we could go to the graduation. But the McDonald's manager made sure we knew, not until you clean up the blood. So, <laughs> oh, so we made it to the Merrill Auditorium. We finally got there after the seniors had already marched in, just in time to secure seats in the back row of the top balcony. I looked over and there's my mother and she's got one kid and he's, he's sniffling and beyond her is my sister with the other kid and she's sniffling and beyond her is my brother-in-law. <laughs> well, when the man on the stage announced Catherine Lee Harris, everything changed. My sister's face showed great pride. The blood stains on my mother's pantsuit disappeared. Disappeared. <laughs> and even my brother-in-law woke up and says, hey, that's Katie. And I remember thinking at that point, you know, this isn't going as badly as it could have. After the ceremony, we met up with Katie down in the parking lot and my family decided that with everything that had gone on, maybe it was better if they just hopped in the car and headed home instead of coming out to Gorham and eating the $87 worth of food I had prepared. So we said our goodbyes, we gave our hugs, and they hopped in the car and headed off in search of the interstate. <laughs> I wonder if they ever found it. I don't know. <laughs> Haven't heard from them since, so who knows. <laughs> my daughter, my son, and I went home, and, and Katie went upstairs to change into her project graduation outfit. And Dan and I stayed downstairs and put quite a dent in that $87 worth of food. A few moments later, this beautiful young woman came down the stairs. She walked up to me, she put her arms around me, and she said, thank you, Daddy, for everything. And then she turned toward the door, and as she reached toward the door, she turned to me, and she sneezed. <laughs> I knew that was... <laughs> tight, I said. And as she closed the door behind her, she laughed. <clears throat> and I cried. Nice story. Thank you. Now, when you have your moose gathering, yes. I should put it that way, yeah. your, your group, um, you have regional storytellers, you have main storytellers, mm -hmm. you have people specialize in mm -hmm. humorous stories. Yeah. Tell me a little more about, you know, who, who, who your tellers are. Okay. Margaret, do you want to talk about a couple of our folks? And uh, the main organization of storytelling enthusiasts has listeners. Listeners. People who are willing just to listen. sit in an audience really? because they just want to listen. <clears throat> we have individuals who are professional performers like Mike and myself. And uh, there's various types of storytellers who perform for entertainment, for a message, for a hope to heal or inform. 
We have a uh, fairy tale oh, story. Fairy tale is my favorite. Yes. Do people dress up? Do they use their hands? I mean, you know, to tell stories? Yes. We have actually a very French storyteller who sings and does the spoons and plays the ukulele. We have others who act out a character. Mm. I'm thinking of our Vernon Lernan. Vernon Vernon. Vernon Vernon. Who performs with a skit as a scout. Yeah. And uh, we also have a third type of party involved with moose. And those are our venue sites. Like this moment right now, we would recognize as a, a site where it's an opportunity for storytellers to tell. Those are examples of the various types of storytellers. I used to have some individuals from community partners perform on the stage at Moose shows and share their life stories. One has been here. Yes. Less has been here. Les Mason has uh, worked with me, and together he learned to share about his stories about living Pine, in Pineland. Pine and why that message is so important not to have one of those places again. Right, right. He has developed his courage and tenacity to continue ta yeah, telling was, his story. Good. Oh, very good. And storytelling. It's a tradition that has started old, since before old, old, there was writing. Before that's there how, was writing. That's how history was passed on. And to be able to continue with that tradition, it's just, it's fascinating to me the different styles that people have. As Margaret said, some are for healing, some are for funny uh, stories, entertainment, some are to teach. And you'll find that most of them are a combination of uh, those things. How long have you been doing it? I've and how been, did you get started? I've been with Moose probably seven or eight years. The organization is probably 10 to 12 years old, I believe. And I just, I used to do a little bit of stage work and tell some funny things, uh, stories that happened to me, real life stories like the one I just told. Mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned that I ought to check out Moose. I go, what's that? Yeah, and nice. so uh, they got me a phone number and I called <laughs> a woman named Jean Armstrong, who was one of the founding members of Moose, along with Deb Friedman, and they've become my family. Um, it's just wonderful. I enjoy going. I can't get to every meeting every month, um, but when I do, I come away just in awe of the talent and the tradition that is continuing. It's just great. When I came to your meeting and heard Joe Radner, who apparently is very well known, um, there was a conference coming up after that. It was storytellers from all over New England. That was out in Western Maine. The Western Maine that? Storytelling Festival. So it was a weekend, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, of people telling stories, performing. There right. were some open mics. There were some feature tellers. There was a, what they called a showcase of local tellers. And there were, I think, six people involved in that. And then one of the things that they did, which I thought was fabulous, was they brought in people who are EMTs, who told stories oh. of real, real life, real drama, real rescue. Um, just awe-inspiring, and I thought that was a great addition yeah, to this is. festival. It's an annual thing, and each year it grows and grows. Are there a lot of conferences and weekend programs going on around the state or New England? Um, yes, uh, we <coughs> have our state of Maine group, the Moose, there is a regional New England group called Lanes. Lanes. L-A-N-E-S. The League for Advancement of New England Storytellers. Oh, oh, oh. 
<laughs> Thank you, you Mike. Uh, See what you learn? Yeah. And from the regional level is a national level, which is the National Storytelling Network, which Moose is a member of as well. The National Storytelling Network, NSN, has an international storytelling event. Mm. Interestingly, once a year, throughout the whole United States, all storytellers come together in November and perform in a celebration. Mm -hmm. Tell, telling stories and celebrating, called celebration, mm -hmm. which contributes uh, its collections towards the National Storytelling Network, but also to the, the local and, uh, groups, their support. And it's a wonderful experience to witness we have had up to 10 people perform in one night, and they each have a different style of storytelling. It's held in November, usually the third, I believe, Saturday of each month. Uh, each Where is it? Where is it held? They change we change. towns? We, we follow the, the opportunities. The church out at Woodford's. We've had it at some of the venues in town where there are stages and, and uh, theaters. Uh, the last couple have been at the Rhines Auditorium in Portland. We used to have it at the, the North Star Cafe, which is no longer there on, on Congress Street. What a wonderful venue that was. What a wonderful group of people. They took us in and, and we had our regular meetings there and the celebration. But look for it in your local newspaper. I will, but also maybe people could come here and do this. Sure. And tell stories with a different theme or, you know, maybe you'll come back. We'd love to. So We'd tell me, to. Moose, when and where you meet. It's monthly. The Again. second Wednesday of every month. At the at Portland Public Library. Portland Public Library, the Rhines Auditorium downstairs, a beautiful venue. There's coffee and snacks and chance to meet with the storytellers. And there's open mic and then there's a featured teller. So it's uh, about two hours of fun and learning and uh, inspirational stories and you walk yeah, away. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Better than you. That I went. Me. So. Maybe we'll be back to do this with some more tellers. I'm Maureen Lyons. This is Margaret Cardoza, Mike Harris, Lion's Den. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>